live from Orlando, Florida, it's theCUBE. Covering ServiceNow, Knowledge17. Brought to you by ServiceNow. Welcome back to Orlando, everybody. This is theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. We go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise, and we're here for our fifth year at Knowledge. This is Knowledge17. Sean Convery is here. He's the general manager of the security business unit at ServiceNow, an area that I'm very excited about, Sean. Welcome back to theCUBE, it's good to see you again. It's great to be here, thanks for having me. So let's see, you guys launched last year at RSA, we talked in depth at ServiceNow Knowledge about what you guys were doing. Uh, you quoted a stat the other day which was, I thought, pretty substantial at the financial analyst meeting, 1.1 million job shortfall in cyber. That is huge. It, that's it, the problem that you're trying to address. Well, it's unbelievable. I, I was, uh, you know, we were just doing the keynote earlier this morning and I was recounting that you know, most people in security get into it because they, they have some you know, desire to save the world, right? To, to, they watched a movie, they read a book, you know, they're really excited and motivated. What to was yours? Was it a comic book? Was it, I, it, was, uh, yeah. it, was, uh, it was War Games with, uh, with Matthew Broderick. Okay. I, was, I was 10 years old, which totally dates me. <laughs> movie came out in 83, so nobody has to look it up. And uh, you know, I was just you know, blown away by this idea of, of using technology and you know, being able to change things. And the trouble is, is you know, the analysts show up to work and, and they don't have that experience and, and nobody would expect it, but they're not even close, right? They wind up being told, okay, here's all this potential phishing email. We'd like you to spend 20 minutes on each one trying to figure out if it actually is phishing. And there's 600 messages. So tell me when you're done and I'll give you the next 600 <laughs> messages. And so it's not, not motivating. It's as sexy as war games. It's, it's <laughs> not as sexy as war games, exactly. <laughs> and, and, uh, and then the CISOs say, well, you know, I can't even afford the people who are well trained. So I hire people right out of school. It takes me six months to train them. They're productive for six months, and then they leave for double their salary. So you wind up with a sort of a 50% productivity rate out of your new hires, and it's just it's just a recipe for 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 the past, right? You know, we, we need to think more about how we how we change things. So let's sort of remind our audience in terms of security. You're not building firewalls. You're you're not. You know, competing with a lot of the brand name security companies like McAfee or FireEye or Palo Alto Networks. You're complementing them. Talk about where you fit in the security ecosystem. Sure, so if you boil down the entire security market, you can really think about protection and detection as the main two areas. Mm -hmm. So protection, think of a firewall, an antivirus, something you're, that stops something bad. And then think of detection as uh, I'm going to flag potentially bad things that I think are bad, but I'm not so certain that I want to absolutely stop them. And so what that does is it creates a cue of behavior that needs to be analyzed today by a human, right? So this is where the entire SIM market and everything else was created to aggregate all of those alerts. So once you've got the alerts, you know, awesome, but you've got to sort of walk through them and process them. So what ServiceNow has focused on is the response category. You know, visualization, aggregation is nice, but what would be much better is to provide folks a mechanism to actually respond to what's happening, both from a vulnerability standpoint and from an incident standpoint. And this is really where ServiceNow's expertise shines because we know workflow, we know automation, we know about system of action, right? So that's our pedigree, and IT, frankly, is several years ahead of where the security industry is right now. And so we can leverage that body of expertise, not just within ServiceNow, but within all of our partners to help accelerate this transformation for security teams. So I got to cut right to the chase. So last year we talked about, and of course every time we get a briefing, for instance, from a security vendor, we're, we're given the stat that it, on average it takes 200, sometimes you've seen them as high as 300, but let's say 200 days to detect an incident and then the, the, the answer is so by our, our, our prevention or our detection solution. Yeah. I asked you last year and I tweeted out you know, a couple days ago is, has ServiceNow affected that? Can you affect, you asked you last year, can you affect that? Can you compress that time frame? You said, we think so. Um, what kind of progress have you made? Sure, so, so you have to remember about that 200 day stat, that that is a industry average across all incidents, right? So the Ponemon Institute pulls this data together once a year, they survey over 300 companies, and they found, it. I think it's 206 days is, is the average right now. And so, to, to identify an in, in, a breach, and then another 70 days to contain it. So together it's nine months, which is a frighteningly long period of time. And so what we wanted to do is measure 
uh, across all of our production security operations customers, what is their average time to identify and time to contain? So it turns out, it, it's so small we have to convert it to hours. It's 29 <laughs> hours to identify, 33 hours to contain, which actually is a 160x improvement in identification and a 50x improvement in containment. And uh, so you know, we're really excited about that. And, but uh, you know, frankly, I'm not satisfied. You know, or I'm still I'm still measuring in hours. Granted, we've moved from months to hours, but I want to go from hours to minutes to seconds, and really, you know, we can show how we can do that in minutes today with certain types of attacks. But there's still the long breaches. But that's a dramatic reduction. You know, I know it's that, that 206, whatever it is, is an average of averages. But sure. But the the delta between what you're seeing in your customer base is not explainable by oh well, the service now customers just happen to be better at it or, or luckier. It's clearly an impact that you're having. Well sure, like, let, let's, let's be uh, you know, as honest as we can be here, right? The, the, you know, the people who are adopting security operations are forward-thinking security customers, so you would expect that they're better. Leading edge, yeah. Right, and so you, their program should be already more mature than the average program. And if you look across those statistics, like 200 and some days, you know, that includes four year long breaches, and it also includes companies that frankly don't pay as much attention to security as they should. But even if you factor all of that out, it's still a massive, massive difference. So if I looked at the bell curve of your customers versus sort of the average in that survey, you'd see the, the, the shift, the lump would shift way to the left, right? Correct, okay. correct. And, and you know, we, we, uh, we actually have a customer, uh, Ron Wakeley from AMP Financial Services out of Australia, who was uh, just up on stage talking about a 60% improvement in his vulnerability response time. So from identifying the vulnerabilities via Qualys, Rapid7, Tenable, whoever their scanning vendor is, all the way through IT patching, 60% faster. And given that, I think it's something like 80% of or 80 of attacks come from existing vulnerabilities, that's a big change. So, to get, so you got to love when, when you're measuring things and you change the variable that you're measuring as opposed <laughs> to the number, right? That, that means you're doing good things. So, so to go from, from, from hours to minutes, is it continuous improvement or are there some big you know, potential challenges that, that you can see that you, if you overcome those challenges, those are going to give you some of these monumental uh, shifts in the performance? I, I, think we're, I think we're ready. I think when we come back next year, the numbers will be even better and, and this is why. So many of our customers started by saying, I have no process at all, I have manual, you know, I'm using spreadsheets and emails and notebooks you know, to try to manage the security incident when it happens. So let me just get to a system of action, let me get to a common place where I can do all of this investigation, and that's where most of our production customers are. So if you look across the ones who gave us the 29 hour and the 33 hour stat, they're really just getting that benefit from having a place for everybody to work together. Where we're going, but this is already shipping in our product, is the ability to automate the investigation. So back to back to the the you know the poor ten year old who was disappointed that he, he didn't get to save the world. You know now he gets to say this entire investigation stage is entirely automated. So if I hand an analyst, for example, a, 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 an infected server, there's ten steps they need to do before they even make a decision about anything. Right? They have to get the network connections, get the running processes, compare them to the processes that should be on the system, look up on a reputation site all the ones that are wrong, like all these manual steps. We can automate that entire process so that the analyst gets to make the decision. He sort of presented the data, here's the report, right. now decide. I, the analogy I always use is the, uh, uh, the doctor who's sort of rushing down in an in a ER show and somebody hands an MRI or an X-ray and he's looking at it you know, through the fluorescent you know, lights as he's walking, and he's like, oh, you know, five milliliters of whatever and do this, right? right like, right. that's the way an analyst wants to work, right? They want the data so they can decide. Right. So it's, it's, it's the classic way that machines help people do better work, right? Which we hear about over and over and over. Let the machines do the machine part, collecting yes. all the shitty, boring data, um, and then present you know, the data to the person to make the decision. Absolutely. Probably with recommendations as well, right? With some weighted average recommendations. Yeah, and this is where it gets really exciting because the more we start automating these tasks, you know, the human still wants to make the decision, but as we grow and grow this industry, one of the benefits of us being in the cloud is we can start to measure what's happening across all of our customers. So when attack X occurs, this is the behavior that most of our customers follow. So now if you're a new customer, we can just say, 
in your industry, customers like you tend to do this, right? right? right. And uh, really excited by what our engineering team is starting to put together. It, it, do you have a formal, or at some point maybe down the road, a formal process where customers can opt into an aggregation of, you know, we're all in this together, we, we are publicly going to share our breach data with one another so that we can start to apply a lot more data across uh, properties to come to better resolution quicker. Well, we actually announced today something called Trusted Security Circles. So this is a uh, capability to allow all of our customers to share indicators. So uh, when you're investigating an issue, the, the indicators of something bad are called an indicator of compromise or an IOC. So we can share those indicators between customers, but we can do that in an anonymous way, right? And so, you know, uh, the analogy I'd give you is, um, you know, what do you do when you lose power in your house? Right, you grab the flashlight, you check the breakers, and then what, you look out the window, because what are you trying to find anybody out? Anybody else out? <laughs> Is anybody else out, exactly. So, uh, you can't do that in security, you're all alone, right? Because if you disclose anything, you risk putting your company further in, in, a, in a bad spot, right? Because now it's reputation damage, somebody discloses the information. So now we've been able to allow people to do this anonymously, right? So it's automatic, I share something with both of you, uh, you only see that I shared if it's relevant, meaning if the ServiceNow instance found it in your own environment, and then if all three of us are in a trusted circle, when any one of us shares, we know it was one of the three, but we don't know which one, so the company's protected. So, just anecdotally when I speak to customers, everybody still is spending more on prevention than on detection. And there's a recognition that that has to shift, and it's starting to. Uh, now you're coming in and saying, invest in response, which right. you remember from our conversation last year, I think is right on, I'm super excited about that because I think the recognition must occur at the boardroom that you are going to get infiltrated. Right. It's the, right. your response that is going to determine the quality of your security. Uh, and, and you still have to spend on prevention and, and detection. <clears throat> but as you go to the market, First of all, can, can you affirm or deny that, that you're seeing that shift from prevention to detection and spending, is it happening sort of fast enough? And then as you go in and advise people to think about spending on responding, what's the reaction? What are you finding is, is the, the, are the headwinds and what's the reception like? Sure, so you know, to your first question about protection to detection, yeah, I, would, I would say that if you look at the mature protection technologies, right, they, they, they are continuing to innovate, uh, but certainly what you would expect a firewall to do this year is, is somewhat similar to what you expected it to do last year. Right. But the detection category really feels like where there's a lot of innovation, right? So you're seeing you know, new capabilities on the endpoint side, network side, anomaly, you're seeing all sorts analytics of Analytics. Analytics, yeah. absolutely. And so uh, I do see more spend simply because more of these attacks are too, too nasty to stop, right? You sort of have to detect them and, and do some more analysis before you can make the decision. You know, to your second question about, you know, what's the reception been when we start talking about response? You know, I haven't had a single meeting with a customer where they haven't said, wow, like, we need that, right? It's very, I've never had anybody go, well, yeah, our program is mature, we're fine, you know, we don't, we don't need this. Um, you know, the question is always just where do we start? And yeah. so we see, you know, vulnerability management is one great place to start. Incident response is another great place to start. We introduced the third uh, 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 way to start uh, uh, just today as well. We uh, started shipping this new capability called vendor risk management, right, which actually right, right. acknowledges the, the, you know, we talked about the perimeterless network, what, five years ago? Something like that, we're <laughs> saying, oh, the perimeter's gone, you know, mobile devices, whatever. But there's another perimeter that's been eroding as well, which is the distinction between a corporate network and your vendors and suppliers. And so your vendors and suppliers become massive sources of potential threat if they're not protected. And so the assessment process, you know, there's telcos who have 50,000 vendors. And so you think about the exposure of that many companies and the process to figure out, do they have a strong password policy, right? Do they follow the best practices around network security, those kinds of things. Right, right. We're allowing you to manage that entire process now. So you're obviously hunting within the ServiceNow customer base, presumably, right? You want to have somebody to have the platform in order to take advantage of, of sure. your product. Um, can you talk about that dynamic, but also other products that you integrate with? What, what are you getting from the customers? Do I 
do I have this capability? Uh, these, this is who I use for firewall, who I use for detection. Do you integrate with them? I'm sure you're getting that a lot. Maybe talk sure, about it. Sure, sure. So, so first off, it, it's important to share that the ServiceNow platform as a whole is very easy to integrate with, right? So there's APIs throughout the entire system. Mm -hmm. you know, we can very easily parse even emails. We have a lot of customers that uh, you know, have an email generated from an alert system and we can parse out everything in the email and map it right into a structured workflow. So you kind of move from unstructured email immediately into now it's in ServiceNow. But we have uh, 40 vendors that we directly integrate with today. And uh, when I was here about a year ago, that number I think was three or maybe even two. And so we're up at 40 now. And uh, uh, that really encompasses a lot of the popular products. So we can, for example, you know, a, a common use case, we talked about phishing a little bit, right? right. You know, let me process a potential phishing email, pull out the uh, URL, the subject line, all the things that might indicate bad behavior. Let me look them up automatically on these public threat sources like uh, VirusTotal or MetaDefender, and then if the answer is they don't think it's bad, I can just close the incident, right? But if they think it's bad, now I can ask the Palo Alto firewall, are you already blocking this particular URL? And if the Palo Alto firewall says, yeah, I was already blocking it, again, you can close the incident. Only the emails that were known to be bad and your existing perimeter capabilities didn't stop do you need to involve people. I have to ask you, uh, it goes back to the conversation we had with Robert Gates last year, but I felt like Stuxnet was this milestone where the, the, the game just got escalated big time. Uh, and it went from sort of you know, harmless, sometimes not harmless, but really up the level of, of risk because yeah. now others, you know, the bad guys really dug into what they could do. And, and, and it became pretty substantial. I was asking Gates generally about sort of the future of warfare and cyber, and he, this is obviously before the whole Russian hacking, but certainly Snowden, you know, and WikiLeaks and so forth was, was around. And he said, the United States has to be very careful about how it responds. We have maybe many more capabilities, uh, but if we show our hand, others are going to see those weapons and have access to those weapons because it's digital. I wonder as a security expert, if you could sort of comment on the state of security, the future of that threat generically or generally, where you see that going. Well, there's a couple of things that come to mind as you're talking. Uh, uh, one is you're right, Stuxnet you know, was an eye opener, I think for a lot of people in the industry that, that, that these kinds of vulnerabilities are being used for, for <laughs> You know, nation-state purposes rather than right. you know just just sort of uh, random bad behavior. So you know, I would go back to what I said earlier and say that um, you know, we have to take the noise, the mundane, off the table. We have to automate that because you're absolutely right. These sort of nation-state attackers. If you're at a Global 2000 organization, right, your intellectual property is valuable. The data you have about your employees is valuable. Right? All this information is going to be sought by competitors, by nation states, and you have to be able to focus on those kinds of attacks, which back to my kind of war games analogy, like that's what these people wanted to do. They wanted to find the needle in the haystack, and instead they're focusing on something more basic. And so I think if we can up the game, that changes things. The second and really interesting thing for me is this challenge around vulnerabilities. So you talked about uh, Gates saying that he has to be careful sort of how much he tips his hand. I think it was recently disclosed that the NSA had a stockpile of vulnerabilities that they were not disclosing to weaponize themselves. And that's a really paradoxical question, right? You know, do you share it so that everybody can be protected, including your own people, right? Like imagine Acrobat, you find some problem in Acrobat. Like, well, do you use it to exploit the enemy or do you use it to protect your own environment? That's so you're kind of, dilemma. You're, yeah. it's a huge dilemma because you're assuming either they have it or they don't have the same vulnerability. And, uh, and so I'm fascinated by how that whole plays yeah, out. It's, and, it's, it's and, a little frightening. And, and you know, in the, in the land of defense, you think, okay, United States has the you know, biggest defense, spends the most money, has the, you know, the, 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 the most you know, amazing machines, whatever. Um, but in cyber, you, know, you presume that's the case, but you don't really know, I think, of high frequency trading. You know, it was a lot of Russian mathematicians that actually developed that. So, you know, clearly other states have, you know, smart people that can, you know, create, you know, dangerous threats. And, uh, Plus they and only have to win once, too. That's, that's, that's kind of the defense game. You got to defend them all. You, you, have to, you have to bat a thousand on the defense side 
or you know, you get it and react. But from the, from the other guy's side, he can just pound, 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 pound. You just got to get through once. And so this is why it's I think tough your, math. your strategy of response is such a winner. Well, well, this is where it comes back to risk as well, right? I mean, at, at the end of the day, you're right. You know, a determined adversary, you know, uh, sorry to break it to everybody, you know, at some point is going to be able to find some way to do some damage. The question is, how do you quantify the various risks within your organization? How do you focus your energy from a technology perspective, from a people standpoint, on the things that have the most potential to do your organization harm? And then, you know, there's just no way people can stop everything unless right, you, right. you know, unplug. <laughs> and then there's a business, then there's the business part of it too, right? Because it's like insurance. When do you stop buying more insurance? You know, you could always invest more, but at, one at what point does the investment no longer justify the cost? Because there's no, there's no simple answer. Well, this is where, uh, you know, we talk to chief information security officers all the time who are struggling with the board of directors conversation. How do I actually have an emotional conversation that's not mired in data around how things are going? And today, they often have to fall back on stats like, you know, we process five million alerts per day, or we have, you know, X number of vulnerabilities. But with security operations, what they can do is say things like, well, my mean time to identify, you know, was, was 42 hours, and, and this quarter it's 14 hours, and so the dollars you gave me Here's the impact. You know, I have 50 critical vulnerabilities last quarter. This quarter I have 70, but only on my mission critical systems. So that indicates future need to fund or reprioritize, right? So suddenly now you've got data where you can actually have a meaningful conversation about where things are from a posture perspective. And these are the assets that we've you know, quantified the value of. These are the ones that we're prioritizing the protection on. And here's why we came up with that priority. Let's look at that. And, you know, agree. Exactly, yeah. you know, large organizations, I was talking to the, the CISO of a, of a Fortune 10, uh, 50, I guess, and uh, he was sharing that it takes 40% of their, their time in incident response is spent tracking down who owns the IP address, 40%. So imagine, you spend 40% of a, you know, 25 hour response time investigating who owns the asset, and then you find out it's a lab system, or it's a spare. You just wasted 40% of your time. But if you can instead know, oh, this is your financial reporting infrastructure. Okay, mm -hmm. super high priority, let's focus in on that. So this is where the business service mapping, the CMDB becomes such a, a differentiator uh, uh, when it's in the hands of our customers. Super important topic, Sean Convery. Thanks very much for coming back in theCUBE and uh, great work, love it. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. All day. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest. This is theCUBE. We're live from ServiceNow Knowledge 17 in Orlando. We'll be right back. <laughs>